Um, but it, it, without any further delay, I'm going to hand over to Darren, who's going to uh, make his presentation. Thanks, Tim, and thanks to the Royal Economic Society for organizing this. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be talking to all of you, and it's a great pleasure to be sharing uh, the stage with uh, Jean. So let me see whether this sharing worked. Okay, so I'm going to talk about unknowns, challenges, and opportunities uh, during the current pandemic. Uh, I think we are clearly going through a very uncertain times. Uh, our whole world is uh, very different today than it was six years ago, uh, not least because there could be millions of deaths and uh, we are uh, probably in the midst of the most severe recession that uh, we have experienced over the last 90 years. And perhaps, and I'm gonna put some emphasis on this, there might be many political changes coming uh, soon. So in some sense, we are experiencing something like the 1918 Spanish flu uh, epidemic, the Great Depression and the Great Recession of 2007, 2008, all rolled into one. But unfortunately, I think there are also uh, a whole set of issues that we don't fully understand. And we have to adopt a lot of policy stances, but we are forced to base them on imperfect knowledge. So what I want to do in this talk is actually emphasize four areas where I think there is need for more thinking, research, and evidence-based policy. And, and it's not just for the short term. I want to sort of, some of those are relevant for the short term, but really also looking into the future, because hopefully soon there will be a post-crisis world. So the questions uh, I want to focus on is the first one, I think that's the one most immediate actually, is the uh, is, is how economic and social behavior uh, uh, interact with epidemics. Uh, so, <clears throat> and in particular, dynamics of infections, I think are key for our current conjecture, for our current situation. And I wanna uh, put some ideas on that on the table. The second is about supply chains, which I think are also relevant both for now and the future. And the third is about, you know, what were the institutional and societal problems that actually led to failures and delays in government responses in many places, uh, including the UK, Italy, US, Turkey. And, and also I wanna spend a few minutes on what the pandemic will imply for the future of economic and political institutions. So uh, for the first one, uh, I think many of you have become much more familiar with the SIR, susceptible infected uh, recovered model that epidemiologists uh, use. And I wanna just show a few uh, equations from that just to motivate uh, one or two questions. And the uh, classic SIR model is uh, for, to economists is a bit like the Diamond's famous coconut model where people run into each other and when they run into each other at some rate, they create new economic and social effects. And here, the key issue is the infection. So susceptible population runs into infected population and at the rate beta, which is the contact rate, that needs to new infections. And at the rate gamma infected population improves. And so the change in infected population is just given by a simple equation like this. So for economists, it's a very natural thing. But of course, uh, the SIR model was first proposed 50 years before Diamond's paper. And uh, sort of just like in Diamond's paper, the fact that there is a increasing returns to scale in the matching technology, in fact, here it's like quadratic susceptible population times infected population, means that you can have very fast increases. And the key parameter, of course, is what epidemiologists call R0, beta over gamma. So the rate at which contact uh, leads to <coughs> infections divided by the recovery rate. Now, lockdowns could be potentially very effective here. Again, if you take this uh, 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 quadratic structure or increasing returns structure and matching into account, because if you lock down, for example, uh, re you reduce the susceptible population that is, uh, you reduce the population that is around by uh, delta uh, by theta, which is a number less than one, then you're reducing both the susceptible population and the infected population that are in the streets. So the rate at which they match is going to be smaller. So that's going to lead to a uh, theta square. So that's where the powerful effects of lockdown would come from. And so the transformed R0 parameter would be beta times theta square over gamma. 
And many people, both economists and epidemiologists and public policy practitioners are now using this way of thinking about the problem. And I think it has a lot to teach us. So this is the Chinese data from a paper that came in Cell a couple of weeks ago. And uh, <clears throat> this is the behavior in Wuhan. And, uh, and one way of interpreting this behavior uh, uh, is that if you look at the early parts, for example, with purple, you have very high R0 above three, and then later on, perhaps around 2.5 or above 2.5. So you see the very, expo very fast exponential growth. But you can also see that with the variety, for a variety of reasons, uh, once the, this R0 or RT number starts coming down, then the number of infections and the number of deaths uh, start declining. So you see the peak uh, here as soon as uh, the R falls below one. And in fact, if you can reduce R to less than something like 0.5, just like the yellow curve suggests, you're going to have very rapid declines in the number of infections. So therefore, when you look at the successes in places like Wuhan or Hubei province, one natural way of thinking about this is the, is the success of lockdown. And I think that's quite plausible. But there is a lot of uh, uncertainty about a lot of the parameters that really you would need to put into these models, you do put into these models to make sense. And I think this is the one set of questions that I want to raise in that context. Actually, you know, beta is not just the immunological or epidemiological parameter is actually an economic and social parameter. It's about the form of interactions that people are engaged in. And it relates to how they spend their time outside, to their economic activities, to uh, various uh, customs and norms. So uh, it is possible that all of the effects that you see in the previous figure are due to lockdown, but plausibly some of it is also due to, even when people are not locked down, they're doing social distancing, they're interacting in different ways. The different subpopulations are different, behaving differently and they have different matching rates with other subpopulations and different uh, uh, immunity or different uh, susceptibility uh, to the virus. But also I think most importantly, economic transactions change because of the virus, because technology is going to be used differently and adopted differently. And all of these are actually relevant because uh, they suggest that not just for forecasting what's going to happen in the future, but also about how to handle ret back to return, uh, the return back to work uh, is going to depend. So it's, you know, one naive way of thinking about it would be to say, well, when we return back to work, it's going to be just like before the peak. But that's not necessarily the case, because depending on regulation, depending on how norms have changed, depending how technology has changed, you can actually have very different types of economic and social interactions. So I think one set of issues is about measurement. But another set of issues is what are the levers that we have for controlling how people interact during such times through information, through regulation, through laws. And I think those are actually important questions that we have to think about. Another one that's, uh, that's relevant that I wanna just put out there is that of course in a uh, globalized world, there's gonna be a lot of cross country linkages which are often missing in the most basic ways that we think about the dynamics of the, pop, uh, of the disease. The second point I wanna, uh, the second theme I want to touch on, again, since I can, I'm, I'm touching on four because I'm not giving any answers, I'm more posing questions. Uh, so supply chains. So uh, I think uh, so far macroeconomic policies in the West and elsewhere have rightly focused on three urgent problems. Transfers to people who are losing jobs or suffering economic hardship. I think that's critical and I think that's the most important thing. It's in part that and other measures limit the collapse of aggregate demand, providing liquidity to businesses through monetary policy and other measures. But I think it's as important to start thinking about supply chains. Uh, when people are kept away from work and uh, when companies start going bankrupt, that's going to uh, uh, create strains for the supply chain. And in the modern world, especially over the last 30 years, supply chains have become very complex. They're partly international, but even their domestic uh, component is extremely complex. Work that I've been doing with Ali Reza Tahpas Salehi, for example, as well as some other work, uh, argues that amplifications of short run and medium run shocks or opportunities can be much amplified by changes in the supply chain. So for example, failures in the supply chain can have an order of magnitude larger effects than uh, other types of multiplier effects through working through neoclassical channels uh, or even the regular input output 
sort of interactions where it works through quantities and prices. And I think that sort of issue might be quite central in the current context because there are going to be a lot of bankruptcies. So the question is, you know, how important is it going to be? Is that something that we have to take as seriously as the other three elements that I've put up there? And also, what is the right way to intervene in the presence, presence of supply chains? For example, uh, if you're worried about businesses in a world where every business is standalone, you have to help them all either through aggregate demand or through liquidity to each of them. Well, in a supply chain, it might be that some critical parts of the supply chain need much more attention and that might actually revive the rest of the supply chain. So there are actually opportunities as well as challenges when you are dealing with supply chain. So there is some work in this area, but there is much more thinking necessary, both theoretically and also from an applied point of view. Institutional failures. Actually, you know, one striking thing is that you know, of course, there are differences in the conditions that in every country, but uh, the variation in the response to the pandemic far exceeds any sort of variation in the conditions. There is uh, the speed with which public health measures were taken, testing, tracing, investments in bolstering the public health system are hugely different, even between, uh, even within the set of developed economies. Why? Well, I think uh, there's going to be a lot of soul searching on this, but I want to put on the table the idea that this is very closely related to the atrophying of the capacity of state institutions. And there has been a lot of reasons for this, in my opinion, and I think we have to think about them both, again, in the short run, but again, for the future as well. I think one important part is the erosion in public trust in state institutions. This has various reasons, some of it related to inequality that I think has been important. There is a perceived or real capture of politics by uh, financial and business elites. Uh, there is a response to the global financial crisis that created a backlash. There has been a related but distinct weakening of technocratic and autonomous civil service as a political strategy in many countries, Italy, the US, the UK, Turkey. And if you look at it, this is not a random list. These are four countries that I think have all botched to the response to the crisis. Uh, there's a general underinvestment in social safety net, the hyper deregulation wave. I think uh, we have to rethink all, all these issues. And of course, what I don't have time to talk about, but I think it's gonna be critical in the next six months is that we're already dealing with extremely weak state institutions and low resources in the developing world. And and the, uh, and the pandemic is going to create real havoc in the developing world. So we have to think about these issues. But just to put some data up there uh, very quickly, this is trust in state institutions in gray and trust in government in uh, brown from Asia Barometer, uh, World Value Surveys, and the European Value Survey. And there are two things here that are interesting and I think are really uh, uh, have been at least thought-provoking for me. One of them, these are all very low. Uh, the level of trust in state institutions is low, except in a few places like Scandinavia, Singapore, and China. Uh, there is some patterns that are relevant for thinking about the problems that we're having, but actually one thing that doesn't square well with the first instinct you might have is that actually tr state uh, is trust in state institutions is actually high in many authoritarian countries like Singapore and China. So why is that? Well, this might be what Timur Kuran called, you know, uh, almost 30 years ago, preference falsification. People fool themselves or tell others because that's what they think others want to hear because they live in an authoritarian world. This is not real trust, but one question is, even if this is not real trust, can this still be exploited during times of crisis more effectively than complete uh, failure of trust that has happened in some places like the US, like Italy? So there, there are some interesting questions that I think we have to go back and think about trust and how we can use it because I think this emergency is not going to be the last emergency that we'll have to deal with and mobilizing state institutions is going to be quite relevant. Finally, what the future may hold. Well, I, am, I have convinced myself, of course you may not be, but I have convinced myself that we are at a critical juncture, meaning that this is a time when our institutions can go in many different paths and there will be some countries that take some paths and others that take others. And in particular, what types of political actions take are taken, what leadership is shown by politicians, 
civil society organizations, and also some idiosyncrasies of existing institutions is going to play an important role about how we deal with these critical junctures. I list here only a few of the questions to which I think we just don't know the answers. Will there be a backlash against globalization or greater international coordination because we realize lack of coordination has been really costly? Will the fear created by the pandemic turn us towards authoritarian leaders. You know, there's a thesis in social psychology that that's exactly what happens. This actually goes back to Adorno's work in political science and social psychology. Or will this thing will make us recognize that these authoritarian leaders by destroying technocracy and, uh, and expertise have actually contributed to millions of deaths around the world? Will we end up with an overeager supercharged Leviathan with no regard for privacy? Because you need to overrule privacy during such times of uh, emergency. And you need to government, as we are seeing in many parts of the world today in the West, uh, the government to take on much greater responsibility in the economy, increase taxes, increase borrowing. Or will we have a way of building a better but still shackled Leviathan? Will this lead to a better understanding of the value of public health, social safety, more democracy, less democracy? So I think those are all up for grabs. But I think we can learn from some historical episodes, both about what might happen and also how we can work towards making the more uh, desirable scenarios more likely. Well, there was a similar set of issues, not identical by any stretch, uh, after the Great Depression and, uh, and, and, and certainly during and after World War two and many people worried about this leading to lots of uh lots of bad institutional outcomes so in 1942 for example much of the audience here is british so they uh, they know very well the beverage report came up in the middle of the war emblematic of the rise of the social safety net and the welfare state in much of post-war europe and it was uh enthusiastically received by the British people. It gave people a boost during the darkest hour of the war. And its uh, provisions started being implemented right in the middle of the war while Britain was under uh, <coughs> uh, uh, under attack from Germany. And after the war, it was wholeheartedly embraced. But Hayek, uh, the brilliant economist, political scientist at the time at the LSC, disagreed and worried that this uh, presaged the state's dominance over society and lead to a new totalitarianism. He said, uh, even a strong tradition of political liberty is no safeguard if the danger is precisely that new institutions and policies will gradually undermine and destroy that spirit. I think Hayek would have had exactly the same reactions to the economic and the social uh, responsibilities that are being asked uh, to be shouldered by current governments today in the age of the pandemic. Was Hayek right? Well, actually, something very different than what Hayek worried about happened. You know, perhaps it's not uh, Hayek's or ideal set of uh, uh, political arrangements that developed after World War II, but after World War II in much of Europe, and actually in Sweden first after 1932, following the Workers' Party's victory, uh, a, a, a democratic but more welfare state-based political system emerged. So how did that happen? Why wasn't Hayek's worst fears realized? Well, the framework that's, of course, I'm not, I don't have time to explain, but is summarized in that figure from my book uh, with James Robinson, my new book with James Robinson, The Narrow Corridor, says, well, much of the West was in the narrow corridor where state and society were balanced. And when we asked state institutions to shoulder more responsibilities because we had to deal with uncertainty, poverty, greater regulation, better aggregate demand management, society also became more vigilant, more active, and democracy deepened. And it, we didn't create an un, un, uh, uh, out of control Leviathan, we created a more capable, we created a more capable Leviathan that we then managed to control quite well in much of the West. And as a result, we got much better public services, much more stable economy, much more investment in R&D, and, uh, and, and we did not sacrifice democracy. So it sounds too good to be true, but perhaps it wasn't all that bad. So I think we are at the cusp of something similar. We need even greater coordination, both international and domestic, much better regulation, a new way of creating social safety net, ways of dealing with privacy concerns while still uh, being able to mobilize resources at the times of emergencies. So I think we need to have new ways of, for society to become vigilant, which is particularly hard because over the last two decades, we have seen 
society become less politicized and less able to engage in democratic politics in some ways, which I don't have time to go into. But I am an optimist. So I think there are ways in which we can rebuild our institutions and perhaps prove Hayek wrong again. And I'll stop there. Thank you.